Okay, so now to our speakers. Well, Ron Bailey is the science correspondent for reason. He's an adjunct scholar at the Cato Institute in Washington, D.C., and he's authored a variety of books on economics, ecology, and biotechnology. Marion Tupi is the editor of humanprogress.org. He's a senior fellow at the Center for Global Liberty and Prosperity at the Cato Institute, and he's co-author of The Simon Project. He specializes in globalization and global well-being, as well as politics and economics of Europe and Southern Africa. Uh, Ron and Marion, thank you very much for joining us uh, this afternoon for you, I know, but this evening for us in the UK. I'm going to hand the floor over to you to tell us a bit about your book. Over to you, Ron. Thank you. Well, thank you very much first for having me uh, on the webinar, the IEA webinar. I'm delighted to, uh, to be able to talk to you about our new book, 10 Global Trends. And what I thought I would do is give a little bit of my background and how I came to want to, to write this book and then how I managed to rope Marion into joining me to do, on the project. Uh, I, I've been covering uh, long-term global trends for a very long time. I got involved with environmental trend and, and reporting as a journalist quite some time ago. But just to draw your, uh, your listeners back in, your viewers back into uh, the, the, the misty past of the 1970s, we'll say at the mid 20th century. Uh, when I was a college student, I was being taught basically that the world was going to come to an end during my lifetime in a very short time. Uh, I, some of your listeners or, or viewers may remember the 1968, the, uh, the uh, population bomb by Paul Ehrlich, which basically predicted that hundreds of millions of people would starve in massive famines in the 1970s, despite any projects that might be embarked upon to prevent it. Uh, then, of course, we had the limits to growth in 1972 during the oil crisis period. And we were going to run out of tin and zinc and oil and natural gas by the year 2000, and the world was going to crash in that way. And prior to that, of course, we had um, Silent Spring uh, by, uh, uh, well, so, uh, Silent Spring. And, and basically the argument there was that, uh, it, that uh, synthetic chemicals were going to cause massive cancer epidemics. We're all going to be dying of that. And these all converged, if you will, uh, it was by Rachel Carson, uh, converged in the 1970s with a, a narrative of doom that I literally thought as a young man, well, my life is going to be hell and very short. So sometime around the late 1980s, I was working as a reporter, staff writer for Forbes magazine, and I noticed not only were we not all dead, the world was actually in a better position. And so I went to my editor there and said, I, what I'd like to do is go back and talk to the people who put these books out and find out what they think about the fact that their predictions turned out to be wrong. So I called up Paul Ehrlich, for example. And he's at Stanford, still there, by the way. And this was around 1990. And I said, Paul, you know, in 1968, you said hundreds of million people are going to die of famines. And aren't you happy that didn't happen? And Ehrlich basically responded to me, well, I just got my timing wrong, Ron. The famines are actually going to occur. And I go, oh, really? When? When? He said that the massive famines will break out between the year 2000 and, you, and the year 2010. We can all remember the great famine of 2005, I'm sure, at this point. Uh, and then, of course, I went into MIT and talked to the limits to growth people, took up their, their book, underlined passages, spent the day chatting with them. And finally, one of the leading guys, a guy named Jay Forrester, turned to me and said, OK, fine, Ron, perhaps we overemphasize the natural resources side of our book. Well, I said, you should have called up the New York Times and tell them that this was the case. So I got involved with followings uh, and, and, and writing about these issues. And, came, and my first book was actually following all these trends. It was basically inspired by the work of Julian Simon, who is also, if you will, the great eminence grease behind this particular project as well. Uh, and I'm sure Marion can uh, share with you a bit more about that. And then I kept following and reporting as a journalist for the last 30 years on all of these trends, climate change, for example, um, famine trends, population trends, what have you. And I, I wrote a book called The End of Doom in 2015, which was an update, if you will, of the stuff I've been writing. And finally, I was going, you know, it sold fairly well, but I, I want, it occurred to me that modern people, modern busy people, uh, need to get the information in a much faster, more direct way. So I, can, I had this idea, well, why don't I create essentially a picture book? And, what, and this is what, in a certain way, 10 Global Trends is. It's basically a book that gives you the data as a trend. 
on one page and in 250 words on the opposite page, we tell you what the trend is. And what we're trying to do is to give people long-term data over, over a period of time, because very smart people are already well aware of the negative problems of the world. They read the newspapers, they pay attention to the reports of think tanks like IEA. They, they know what the bad problems are. But our view is, is that, and a lot of people try to characterize this book as optimistic, but it's not optimistic. It is basically realistic. It's basically trying to go back as far as we can with all kinds of resource trends, population trends, educational trends, uh, political trends, what have you, and update them so that people, smart people, would be able to go to this book and very quickly gather the information they need to figure out how to solve the, pro the real problems of the world. One of the catchphrases is, is you can't fix the problems of the world unless you know what's actually happening. And this is the kind of book that we've tried to create in this way. So I had this book in mind for a couple of years, but I couldn't figure out how to do it. When, of course, I realized that my friend Marion Tupi is all about trends. He runs this fabulous website called humanprogress.org, which collects this information and reports it all the time. And I was going, well, obviously, this is the guy I should uh, uh, work with to figure this out. We went out to lunch. I told him my idea, and he very uh, graciously agreed to help me out write the book. And the result is 10 Global Trends which is now available, and we hope very, will be very useful to uh, your viewers at some point. Well, Ron, thank you very much for, 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 that, for, for that outline. Uh, Marin, why don't you add, add, add a bit here, and then we'll uh, turn to Q&A. Please, um, if you're watching at home or wherever you're watching from, please don't forget to submit your questions uh, in Q&A. Feel free to submit more than one question if you like. We want this to be a, a proper discussion. Uh, Marin, over to you. Thanks. Um, one of the things I want to add to uh, Ron's original conception was to produce what is essentially a coffee book, uh, coffee table book, uh, which is to say that uh, not only should it be informative, but also that it should be visually appealing. So we put a lot of effort into uh, ma making the design as uh, uh, beautiful as possible. And uh, production value of the book is also very high for a simple reason that uh, we don't want the book to uh, be read once and then put away somewhere on a uh, bookshelf what we want it uh, for it to is for it to be really on on that dining room table or, or living room table so that when uh, people come for a visit um, they can flip through it maybe it will lead to some sort of a discussion um, and uh, maybe people will say, well, did you know, um, or alternatively, uh, there's a conversation about how the world is coming to an end and uh, the host or the hostess may say, well, let's see what this good book has to say about it. <laughs> and um, uh, again, one of Ron's original idea is that the book should be light on theory. And in fact, there is very little theory in it, uh, mm -hmm. except I think for the introduction. Um, and, and that's because as Ron said, uh, people have a limited amount of time and uh, th th there are, there's a very limited number of people who really want to delve deeply into a book like Enlightenment Now by Steven Pinker. Steven Pinker is a great intellect who's produced, in my view, the best book on human progress yet, which is Enlightenment Now. But it is a heavy lift. Uh, it is full of graphs too. But you have to get through a lot of uh, theory and explanations that you would expect from a Harvard scholar um, to to get the to get to get to the information. And and we thought there may be a market niche for something simpler, and that's really what uh, uh, what produced this book. A um, couple of other things I want to mention. One is why is this book important, and that is because. Not only has 2020 been a very weird year, uh, but there has been a, um, a growing dissatisfaction, depression, anxiety, and uh, a general feeling of unease about, uh, about where humanity in general is going and where Western societies in particular are going. And this has been going on for some time. Um, uh, certainly, it predated uh, the Trump administration, and um, and uh, and that's partly because I think uh, that we no longer teach history, we no longer read history. History is considered to be dry and boring, and as a consequence of that, 
very few people have any strong sense of what the world was like even 50 years ago. Um, you know, even 50 years ago, um, uh, different minorities, be it blacks or gays or, or women for that matter, uh, didn't enjoy, uh, well, with women a little bit longer, but nonetheless, people didn't enjoy, uh, these people didn't enjoy the kinds of uh, equal protections and rights enjoyed by other people. Um, similarly, uh, healthcare, we may, com we may complain about uh, um, the, the price of healthcare, but the fact is that by today's standards, healthcare was quite primitive as late as 1970 or 1968. <laughs> Doctors used to smoke whilst examining uh, pregnant women well into the 50s and the 60s. Um, and of course, the general, um, uh, the general level of wealth is uh, much higher than at any point in human history. And I think that if people don't know these facts, um, if they live only in the present and they cannot compare the present with any other point in time, they may be tempted toward either utopianism, which didn't have a stellar history of improving uh, human welfare during the 20th century, or they may feel a sense of ingratitude um, about the economic and and political underpinnings of modernity. So um, if you think that the world is going to hell and nothing is getting better and everything is worse, then why on earth should you support some form of representative government or some form of uh, free market capitalism? Uh, makes no sense. You might as well opt for the alternatives. Um, and so by reminding people of what life was like in the past, because of course every chart in our book is retrospective. It looks at uh, it looks at developments before. We hope that people will realize that this is actually not a bad place and the place in time to live. Um, and finally, a quick comments on uh, on pessimism. Uh, yes, it is true that um, growth rates in Western countries uh, have slowed down in recent decades. There are many different uh, possible. Uh, explanations for that, including uh, the introduction of Eastern Europe, former communist bloc, and China into the global economy, which may have suppressed uh, wages and so forth. Um, so th there are competing explanations why things in the West haven't been going as well as they could have been, just from a strictly income per capita standpoint. But um, but there are also many other reasons why people would perceive today's world in a much darker way than, it's, than it ought to be. And this is called a negativity bias. And this negativity bias uh, uh, is constituted of a number of psychological tricks that our mind, because of evolution, plays on us, uh, including uh, uh, the fact that bad is stronger than good. In other words, we fear losses uh, and risks more than we uh, look forward to gains. Um, um, another thing is availability heuristic, which is to say that our mind tends to pull from that memory file in our brains only mo the most horrific instances um, of memory. And therefore, we tend to think about the world in, in a much as much more dangerous place. Um, People think that their chances of, for example, dying in a terrorist attack are much higher than dying by slipping in a bathroom, whereas the reality is the, is the exact opposite. Your chances of dying by slipping on a wet floor in a bathroom are much, much order of magnitude higher than dying due to a terrorist attack. And there are many other aspects to this negative, ne negativity bias. So they all have to be kept in mind. And... Uh, um, what we hope is that the book will uh, uh, engender, in, engender a sense of perspective, uh, proper perspective, based in reality, and uh, that will imbue people with rational optimism about the future. Well, uh, Roland Marion, thank you very much for that uh, overview. I've just to let you know, I put a couple of uh, links into the chat function. The first one is the Human Progress website, humanprogress.org. But also the 10 Global Trends has also got its own website, and that can be found at uh, 10globaltrends.org.
www.thepodcast.org. You'll find both of those links in the chat function. Please keep your questions coming. We have about nine questions so far. I'm sure um, you know we'll, we'll try and get through as many as possible. But can I just start off with a bit of you know human nature? You know, people say that uh, people don't want to believe the worst or they're pessimistic. You know, you spoke about this, uh, Marion, both of you. Do you think there's also a couple of other elements to this when, I, when, I, when I've been looking at this? And I just want to know your view on this, which is one people say, well, actually, a lot of people bank progress. You know, it's all very, you know, so when yes. they hear from people like me and say, oh, in my day, I only had three TV channels and do you guys have got 200 channels. Well, so what? We want more progress. We don't want to compare it to what you, know, what you had when you were younger. And the second thing is, is it some of partly our genetic makeup, the fact that if, you know, historically that we had to remember the worst things for survival? Now, we don't need to remember the bad things for survival. So those are just two ideas I want to throw out to both of you. Ron, you're nodding, so I'm going to come to yeah. you first because I like people who agree with me. So I'll go to you. <laughs> uh, well, the, your notion of banking progress, we do discuss that in the book. It's basically the idea is, and there's another way we put it is progress hides itself. The thing is problems get solved and people forget all the problems that existed prior to their, their moment of existence right now. And so basically, you're right. They bank progress. And then they, we, we create new problems or new problems come into view that we didn't know were problems. And now we have the resources, time and attention to devote to trying to solve those problems. So absolutely right. We do bank progress. Progress hides itself. And that's something we want to remind people of, again, by showing, look at all this progress. It's an amazing amount of progress. We look at wealth trends, population trends, uh, famine, I mean, everything so many things are so much better than uh, people had, had thought they would be only a generation or two ago. And yes, you're absolutely right about that. Okay. Marion, do you want to add to that? Yeah. Um, the, I, I needed to look this up because it's the most impossible terminology, as you would expect from Harvard psychologists, David Lavari and uh, Daniel Gilbert. They talk about prevalence-induced concept change in a human uh, judgment. Right. And uh, basically... Uh, what these two psychologists have found is that as we reduce the prevalence of a problem, I'm quoting from them, such as discrimination, for example, we judge each new behavior in the improved context that we have already created. Right. Another way of uh, saying this is that solving problems causes us to expand the definitions of them, of those problems. When problems become rare, we count more things as problems. Our study suggests that when the world gets better, we become harsher critics of it. And this can cause us to mistakenly conclude that it hasn't actually gotten better at, at all. Progress seems to uh, mask itself. So that's just a um, long-winded way of, of uh, making Ron's point. Uh, genetics. Um, uh, th there's the role of the amygdala, uh, which is the part of our brain which is responsible for primary uh, emotions such as fear um, and, and anger. Um, and the interesting thing is that as information enters your head, your mind through your eyes, um, it first goes to the amygdala, which is connected right to your nervous system. So for example, if you see, a, uh, uh, if you see something squirrely on the ground that could potentially be a snake, or even if it is a snake, um, amygdala will force you to jump back in expectation that that squiggly thing on the floor is something that could kill you. It is only later, I mean, we are talking nanoseconds here, that that same information goes into the back of your brain, which then matches the image on the ground with whatever is at the, at the back of your head. So for example, if you see a garden variety snake that thing will tell you nothing to worry about. Or if you see a, a, a rattlesnake, it will tell you you've done the right thing, you should run away. But it's a very interesting thing is that the information first enters your nervous system, only then it enters the, uh, the memory uh, folder uh, and the analytical folder. And that is, again, a long-winded way of saying that there is a genetic uh, hardwiring to us to look out for danger. 
Yeah, that's good. Thank you. Well, we've got about ooh, 11 questions, so let's see how many we can get through. Uh, no, don't feel under any pressure to get through all of them, but if you can, that's great. If not, just you know, answer the questions as you want to answer them. So first one is from Neil Munnery. For Neil, thank you very much for joining us this evening. Um, the question is, great idea. Can you generalise across the trends you have examined? What is the key drivers or enablers of positive progress? Is it a general mix of technology, human endeavour, incentives, political and economic systems, or can you point to some fundamental drivers that are key to you? If I may, uh, one of the ways I think of it is, is that one of the, the trends we point out is if, if you're looking at life expectancy, for example, if you were looking at wealth, if you were looking at all kinds of political trends, the fact of the matter is there was an inflection point in human history that occurred about two centuries ago. Prior to two centuries ago, the the natural state of humanity was abject, ignorant, violent poverty for the vast majority of people. And so something changed. And what that changed, as we do identify that, is a change in institutions. Um, essentially, the Enlightenment occurred. And the, the schemata that I come up with very briefly, I take from Jonathan Rauch in his wonderful book, Kindly Inquisitors, is that what happened is three new institutions came into existence almost by accident. And those institutions he basically calls uh, de democracy, representative democracy, whereby a, uh, legitimate authority was, uh, was able to be transferred in, in uh, an orderly way between, uh, uh, between uh, groups of people. Uh, the second one was, if you will, free markets capitalism, which is how people decided to, who, get, who gets what and also how to encourage people to innovate and, and be rewarded. And then the, the third critical thing is what he calls liberal science, which is uh, basically radical free speech and tolerance. Uh, that was the first time in all of history where everybody gets to criticize everybody else. No one has authority to say, this is the absolute truth. One way I like to think of it is, is that I may not know the absolute transcendent truth of, of the world and, ex and existence, but I'm pretty damn sure you don't either. So let's just agree to disagree. So basically, it's democracy, uh, uh, free markets, and if you will, free speech that came together to create the institutional environment that has enabled the vast enrichment that we've seen over the last two centuries. Okay, Marion, do you want to add to that? Well, first of all, let me say how wonderful to be um, uh, virtually connected to Neil Monnery, uh, whose work on, uh, on Hong Kong, I highly recommend to everyone, and I grieve with him over what happened. Um, in, in recent months um, in that city, um, which is a uh, good example of what happens when the ideas that uh, Ron talked about are put into practice. My second book that I'm working on currently focuses on population growth and the fact that uh, human beings currently, uh, before AI, but currently are the only producers of ideas. So if I could make... Uh, a pitch for the, the ideas contained in the second book, it would be that what's, what's crucial is population times idea, uh, sorry, times freedom. Uh, you need more and more people to produce ideas. Of course, uh, there are almost 8 billion of us, but good ideas are produced by a fraction of the population. It doesn't matter whether you are in, in Europe or Africa or, or Latin America or the United States, there is only a small fraction of people who are the true inventors and innovators. And so uh, more people uh, in the last uh, two, 300 years, the tremendous population growth also allowed for the greater growth in these, of, of these um, um, individuals. We have more numbers of them. Uh, and that coincided with uh, greater liberalism, um, the ability for these people to think, to talk, to publish, to exchange ideas, and then to market them, um, which is a, just a slightly different way of how Jonathan put it and how, how Ron put it. But essentially, the role of freedom, I think, of, of classical liberalism is absolutely central to no matter, no matter how you look at the explanations of the great enrichment, the role of classical liberalism of freedom is crucial for all of them. Thank you. So next question from Alex Lee. Um, and I'm going to start with you, Marion, uh, before we move on to Ron. Uh, for both panellists, which trend is your favourite and why? Um, um, 
<laughs> well, the, the, the most obvious one that, that is very important is life expectancy because uh, you need to live more in order for, for the, all the other trends to, uh, to apply. So life expectancy is important. Uh, as late as 1900, at the time of Queen Victoria, uh, the richest people in the world, which includes Britain, could expect to live to about 50. That's it. Life expectancy was 50 years. Uh, today, in Western countries, it's somewhere between 78 and 80. Uh, the global life expectancy uh, is 72. So somebody living in Malaysia or in Brazil could, could live to the late 60s, early 70s, um, which, is, which is already much higher than what it was in the richest, uh, in the richest countries in 1900. So that's what I would say is probably my favorite. Okay, Ron, what about you? I'm going to go with the end of poverty. And one of the, the, the data that we show is, again, going back to my point, is the natural state of humanity up until two centuries ago was abject poverty. We have very good data on absolute poverty, which is defined by the World Bank as $1.90 per day per person. And uh, you can scale that back. And around 1820, 90% of humanity lived on less money than that per day. And what we do is we follow that trend and show that it took 160 years, basically, to go from uh, from 90% to 41% in 1980. And that's 160 years, uh, basically cut uh, poverty in half. But since then, it's gone down to 8.6%. It's a huge drop off. It's been an enormous improvement. And the other reason that we cited is, is that we also point the, the first trend is the great enrichment, how much wealth has actually been created and how, how much better off the world is. But I wanted to cite the poverty trend because it shows that this wealth increase was distributed across more billions of people. It didn't all go to the top 1%, as some people might suggest. So the world got richer, but it also got a lot less poor. And this enabled all the other things that we point to in the book, better education, longer life expectancy, uh, a, a, a better, a better health care all of those kinds of things. And so I think the end of poverty is what, what we refer to it as is my favorite trend. Great. Okay, so uh, next question, we still got about 13 questions, but uh, let's see how many we can, we can get through. Um, next one, for, uh, anonymous attendee. Um, maybe it's a variation of the first question I asked you, or maybe it's not. It's uh, why, do, what do you think attracts people so strongly to apocalyptic views of the future? Was it the issues we were talking about earlier, or was it the same things that, for example, people are attracted to horror films, or they read newspapers if there's bad news but not good news? You know, um, Ron, what, what's what's your thought? What are your thoughts on this? Um, I think that there's one. There, there there's been a lot of writing about this. There is a a, a tendency for people to uh, have put themselves, if you will, in the center of a historical drama to some extent that essentially they want to believe that they are at the hinge point of history and that what they're doing matters for all time in a way that previous generations, you know, just muddled through and we have to solve the, the critical crisis now. And I think there's a, a tendency to accept that view uh, among people. Um, but it's always been thus. I mean, if you go back and you read any particular part, time in history, the historians, or if you will, the politicians or the pessimists of the time are going, if we don't do this now, all of history will come to an end or be terrible. And so we're, basically it's a human tendency to, if you will, think of ourselves as being uh, the critical component for solving for all time, the, the, whatever the problem in front of us is. And the truth of the matter is, is that the institutions we've created are those sorts of institutions that are solving those problems. And we should sustain those institutions if that's what we want to do. Marion, do you want to add to that? Um, sure. So apocalypse uh, has been present in uh, pretty much uh, all the uh, known religion during, religions during the historical period. And uh, even Christianity, until relatively recently, a few hundred years ago, embraced asceticism and uh, looking forward to the afterlife as the place where things would get well. Therefore, praying for and expecting an apocalypse, uh, the, the second coming or what have you, uh, was something to be looked forward to rather than something to be uh, postponed. Uh, it was really only in the last two or 300 years with the increase of prosperity that, uh, that our entire mentality about apocalypse uh, uh, changed, um, or rather 
um, that we we stop being ascetic within the uh, within within the traditional religions. But of course, with the decline of religions, um, we have new apocalyptic belief systems which are creeping in because that 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 need for apocalypse, the end of days. That's and 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 the, and the sense of. Uh, uh, as Ron said, something larger than than we are that we are involved in a a an attempt at immortality by doing something world changing that is still with us, and so even people who do not have explicitly a religious beliefs so who are secular in every conceivable way have structured their belief systems, such as for example in uh, the environmental apocalypse, around some very obvious religious uh, hinge points, such as the fact, that, or, or rather such as the notion that the world was once pristine, but through industry and chemicals and whatever, we have despoiled it. Apocalyptists, uh, environmental apocalyptists also expect that the world will end in very short order. So um, the, I, I think that the, the need for I call it religion, uh, but you might call it something, uh, the need for the transcendental, the need for some sort of an immortality project is deeply innate. Uh, and it's, it's so even amongst the secular people who wouldn't, who wouldn't want to be seen anywhere near traditional religions. Yeah. Okay. Well, and also, you know, I, as you say, how, how, for how long or how much history of people saying the end of the world is nigh? Um, you know, uh, pe people have been uh, predicting that. I think we remember the cartoons, but I'm sure they're probably ancient tablets, maybe even the pyramids with someone saying, you know, the end of the world is nigh. Um, actually, for them, it was. What, uh, anyway, uh, Rob, uh, Rob, uh, Rob White asks the next question, and I'm going to come to you first, Marion. He uh, thanks you both for coming on today. He says, do you think the fact that our parameters for reflecting on society's problems are constantly improving is a good or bad thing? For example, is it positive because it means our moral compass is constantly changing or is it bad because it shields one's ability to appreciate the progress that has been made? It's generally positive so long as it doesn't begin to conflict with other values that you feel passionate about. Let me give you an example. Obviously, racial relations in the United States um, which is the country where I live in, I, I feel more comfortable discussing than, say, Britain, um, have improved dramatically um, uh, in, uh, since the Civil War. They have improved dramatically since the 1920s when lynchings were going on, and they have improved once again since the 1960s when we had civil rights legislation. And with every one of these steps, American definition of what an act of racism was has changed within that improved context. But you could see how today or 20 years from now, a definition of racism could change in such a way that it will become, um, that it will sit uneasily with things like, for example, expression of personal preferences. Dating apps, I'm told, um, in the United States have now um, uh, extinguished racial preferences uh, in, in, in dating, which is to say that you can no longer say I'm a white male looking for an Asian woman or a black man looking for a white man or whatever. Um, because personal preferences have now become, um, um, have become equivalent with racial prejudice. And so I would say that at some point in the future, maybe you are there already, um, the definitions of racism and other bad things could become so vast, so all-encompassing, uh, that it will not be possible to um, exercise personal freedom on a day-to-day basis. Okay. Ron, do you have a view on the question? I'm so entranced by what Marian was saying. I'm trying to, I guess... Uh... I guess what I would say is for the most part it's progress. Again, I think there's been considerable moral progress that Marion has certainly alluded to on that is that as over time we've, we've the circle, if you will, of, of human empathy and, and sympathy has expanded in, in ways that Adam Smith would have advised this would occur over time. And I, and I think that that's 
almost wholly to the good. We, we end up with uh, what I think what Marion was describing, I believe will be a dead end. In fact, that uh, I believe that tolerance will once again be the cardinal virtue and that we will revert back to that after a, an excursion, if you will, into, if you will, identity politics. Um, as as uh, Mario Vargas Llosa wrote uh, in a great essay a while back, is identity and identity politics are the exact opposite of liberalism. And I think that that is a, is a passing phase that uh, was that right now in our, in our current history and that we will revert back to classical liberalism and tolerance. Um, yeah, uh, uh, let me actually say one more thing on this. Uh, and that is that um, uh, one of the crucial aspects of modernity of the age of enrichment um, and of a liberal society is the ability to speak freely, even at the risk yes. of offending somebody. And I'm not the first person to make this point, uh, Jordan Peterson has made it before, is that depending on the size of the room, you are guaranteed to offend somebody. Uh, if you have 10 people in the room, maybe you feel 10% constrained to say what you feel like. Uh, if the room is 100%, uh, you know, 100 people in the room, you may, you may wish to say even less that's interesting, that's novel, that's controversial because somebody's going to get offended. And obviously, if you're talking to a, to a population of 330 million people uh, like we have in the United States, and if you are a politician set on uh, winning an election, then you're not going to say anything that is of any interest to anybody. You're just speaking platitudes. And that's not a way of, um, that's not a way of uh, encouraging, promoting, and defending progress in society. Uh, Novel ideas tend to be discomforting to a lot of people. And, but I, I agree with that. But I think, again, what we're doing is we're in a process of negotiating, if you will, the proper ways of handling social media and, and reaching a larger audience over time. We are still in that evolutionary process of figuring out how tolerance operates in an environment where everyone can watch everyone else. And I, you know, perhaps I'm just being... Uh, my middle name is not Pollyanna, but perhaps I'm being a bit that way at this moment. I do think that that in 10 years, 20 years, uh, this moment will have been will have been uh, seen as an aberration, if you will. Yeah, but also our own views evolve as well, don't they? I mean, partly right. bank. Um, I, you know, I think this goes back partly to the, what we talked talk about banking, particularly when Marion was talking about uh, racial discrimination. You know, I know, for example, when my father came to Britain in the 50s, you know, it was difficult for him to get a room to rent, for example. Right. Uh, but as, by the time I was a kid, that wasn't so much a problem. But I remember being chased by thugs with knives because of my colour. Um, you know, and I remember then speaking to an event uh, not so long ago. I was talking to a bunch of uh, young kids and they were talking to me about microaggression. And I said, and, and what they meant by microaggression was if someone sees your colour and says, where's your family from or, where, or are you Indian or are you African, you're, uh, that's microaggression. And I said, that, that's not aggression. Aggression is being chased by skinheads, with knives, you know. But, but what, frankly, I think what they've done is, as, you, as we said earlier, I think they've banked the progress that has occurred since my day or since my, when I was younger. Right. And they don't get that so much. I mean, they still get it to some extent, but they get it, you know, but it's not, you don't get so many people chasing them with knives, but they get people asking them questions about based on their skin color. I suspect that's what it is. And, and, you know, that's obviously evolved. You, you can't ask it anymore. You know, some of the phrases when I was a child be, that people would use, you can't use those phrases anymore. You know, think about the, the word uh, black or the N word or other words, you know, that will seem to be n more acceptable, but less acceptable now. And um, so I think we, we evolve as well. Okay, next question. Um, uh, back to the trends. Uh, you know, we asked about your favorite trend. The next trend, there's, there's going to be a trend of questions here. Uh, the next question, question is, which trend do you think will be most impactful, uh, Ron? I, I, probably the great enrichment, but uh, in, and what we also do, we're not only looking retrospectively, we also try to see what will the world be like, what level of, of, of wealth will be created over the next 80 years or so as the century progresses. And on very reasonable assumptions, that, and I want to point out again that the data that we cite in this book are meant to be totally uncontroversial. I mean, we're, we're not trying to come up with any uh, stuff that people might think is fringe or anything like that. But the world, uh, the per capita GDP uh, around uh, the 2100 globally should be somewhere north of $100,000 in real dollars. 
Uh, right now on planet Earth, it's about $15,000 per person, obviously not distributed equally. But so basically, we, we expect that it will increase basically eight times over the next part of the century. And so right now, the world economy is what, 120 trillion? It'll be over a quadrillion at that point. But more, more than that, this is in real dollars. But the technologies are unimaginable that this amount of money would be able to buy and to purchase and so forth. It's just not only uh, the amount of wealth. It's not just raw ability to buy more iPhones. It's going to be able to buy whatever AI-enabled technology that will make your brain part of uh, the, you know, the uh, British Museum. It, it's, so those, those trends are going to be technologically and wealth-wise, the world is going to be, uh, we, we, in a certain sense, from our grandparents' point of view, we already live in a science fiction world. The 2100 is going to be really science fiction and pretty amazing. Marion, do you want to carry on that? What we do, which one do you think will be most impactful? Which trend? Um, we don't specify it in the book, but we allude to it in the text pertaining to other trends. And that is the uh, tremendous progress that is being done in medical sciences, uh, in uh, genetics, uh, CRISPR-Cas9, uh, the genetic editing uh, technology and so forth. Um, so when we are talking about COVID and um, perhaps in some other contexts in the book, we mention uh, the amount of uh, progression uh, in the medical sciences. And uh, I certainly hope that um, some of the world's biggest killers uh, can be eliminated uh, through CRISPR-Cas9 and through uh, other types of biomedical research. Okay, well, um, I have to say that we are, uh, we don't believe in censorship here, we believe in free speech. So I'm going to read out the next question. Uh, Marion, it brings together two trends that you talked about. One is dating, the second one is COVID. And it, it's, it's, it's aimed at you. What dating app would Marion recommend I use? COVID really messed up my love life. <laughs> Tell um, Alex Hammond not to play games with me. Uh, <laughs> you, think, you, you think it's Alex Hammond, do you? We're, we're, let's, we're, we'll test that. Uh, I'm, not going, to, I'm yeah. not going to talk about Alex's. I'm not going to talk about um, uh, dating apps. Uh, <laughs> don't worry. Don't worry. I, I, this gives you a nice link to the next question, which actually is from Alex Hammond. So Alex has actually now asked a question in his own name rather than anonymously. He said, thanks both. Big fan of your work. What do you think of the idea that contrary to the perceived classical liberal wisdom, that big government crushes liberty and progress? Instead, the story is more like advances in liberty brings about progress, which then cause bigger government. Do you agree with this? If so, what can be stop done to stop the ever expanding size of government? Whichever one of you wants to jump in, please do. Um, I'm going to vote for Marion first. OK, that's very democratic. Well done. <laughs> the, the, the relationship between um, increased uh, wealth and the Wagner law, which is an increase in uh, social spending is a very real one. Yep. Um, but uh, to, to make people at IEA and, uh, and Cato happy, it doesn't seem to be a, uh, uh, it, it doesn't seem to be an exponential one. It doesn't seem to be one that, that goes from, let's say spending 5% of GDP on on social welfare to 100% of GDP on social welfare. There is a cutoff point where the Wagner's law just doesn't keep on increasing exponentially, but where spending on welfare sort of tends to move within a snake, like an ERM snake between say, I don't know, uh, 30 and uh, 55, 60% of, of GDP. Um, and there are, that's because at some point um, in any society, what becomes clear is that there can be too much of a good thing that far too many people are taking advantage of, of welfare spending, and not just individuals, um, but also corporations and, um, and crony capitalists. And in addition to that, there seems to be a hard limit on how much money P, uh, governments can raise in revenue. It's not so simple as saying we would like to increase social welfare spending from 30% to 60% or 70% of GDP. At some point uh, when the tax um, 
uh, when the tax burden becomes too burdensome, uh, the tax revenue actually starts going down. That's the, uh, that's the Laffer curve. And so, and so, yes, there is a, uh, uh, there is a relationship between uh, increased riches and more welfare spending, but it is not, it, it doesn't hold indefinitely. Okay. Uh, and to and to some extent, we should be. I would. I would. I. To some extent, also, we should think about uh, with regard to other kinds of freedoms. I understand that you know the the uh, transfers are are an imposition on liberty to some extent or other, but you also find in countries with fairly large levels of social support, uh, increasing civil rights and recognition, if you will, of 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 uh, people's individual rights to, to flourish in their own particular ways. You increase tolerance, if you will, of different lifestyles. And I think that that's also an advantage that occurs then. Okay, good. We've got about uh, just over, just, on, just over, just about 10 minutes left. Um, we've got about nine questions. We're obviously not going to get through all of them. So can I ask people to please go to the Q&A function and vote on your favourite questions, and we'll ask the top questions. Uh, the top one at the moment is uh, the person that says, I hope this is relevant. Plus, I'm sure Saeed will like this question. Uh, thank you very much. I, I appreciate the fact that you're thinking of my welfare here. Um, would the panelists agree that free trade and the spread of markets globally has done more for peace than anything else? The trend of large scale on uh, scale state on state violence has definitely decreased. Ron, you're nodding. Or do you want to say? Yeah. No, absolutely correct. I don't think I need to add anything more. More trade, more more peace. Uh, Marion, do you want to add anything? More than a thumbs up. Two, th two thumbs up. Yeah. Well, as is well known, the relationship between peace and trade broke down spectacularly in 1914. And that has been thrown in the faces of the Ricardians and the Smithians and Ron Bailey's and Marianne Tupi's of this world for a long time. But I think that what we have, which people in 1914 didn't have, is a clear sense of what happens when the world goes to war. Uh, not only can we see the devastation of the First and the Second World Wars in the movies, and we can and relate to the real suffering of what happens when the world is at war, um, but also I think that humanity has much more to lose now than before, not only in terms of material wealth, but also the fact that um, human life, I think, has become more precious, not least because we are having many fewer babies um, uh, throughout the West, even in China and other places. So uh, every additional human life is uh, becoming more precious uh, and uh, it would be terrible ways to waste it. Okay. Um, oh, sorry, top of the table keeps changing. So first, uh, next question is, why did you include the word smart in your title? Would a title that said 10 global trends that everyone needs to know sell more? Does, it, um, does that mean that people who don't consider themselves smart are not going to buy your book? Uh, you know, um, you know, any idea? You know, why did you use the, the idea of smart? Was it just to get some sales? Was it your idea? Uh, it was my idea. And it partially was for, for sales. But also, uh, going back to the point I tried to make a little bit earlier, is that smart people already know all the negative trends. They're already facing the world. They see all the data. They read the newspapers. They watch television. They listen to BBC. They read IEA reports. And so we wanted to attract the smart people as well who are paying attention to these other trends to say, look at these longer-term trends. But I confess there was a little bit of salesmanship in there. And that's not a bad I, thing. You know, we, we, you know, we, we, we encourage that as well. But Mario? <laughs> I want to add to that something, and that is that, as um, Stephen Davis of um, uh, IEA uh, has pointed out, um, it is the elites which are the drivers of change in society um, in general, um, throughout human history. And if the elites believe in the wrong stuff, the chances that the society is going to follow down the wrong path is going to increase exponentially. So having the elites, intellectual elites, of course, I mean, um, being correct in their perception of the world is uh, on balance um, more or relatively more useful uh, than having everyone else uh, know it. 
very interesting. Always a chat, always a debate within the uh, classical liberal movement, probably other movements as well. You know, how do you change uh, the views or the per uh, pervading views of society? Indeed, when the IA was founded, the founder, uh, Anthony Fisher, I think, said to Hayek that he was thinking of going to politics. Uh, to change views, and 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 uh, Hayek convinced him to set up a think tank, and here we are, fifty-five years later, uh, doing webinars. Who would have foreseen that? That's progress in the in, in the think tank world. Okay, um, now a variation on uh, of previous questions about pessimism, and this is to do with nationalities. Uh, the person says, I read an article recently that said in a 2019 new Gov poll found that 68% of Britons thought that the world is becoming a worse place to live. In a similar poll in 2016 covering 17 countries, the British were in the least optimistic third. Are some nations naturally more pessimistic than others? And if so, why might that be? Is it because of our terrible weather or is there another reason behind it? Um, one, one interesting relationship that uh, Steven Pinker describes at length in, uh, I think it's chapter on happiness in Enlightenment Now is that people who are seeing a lot of growth, a lot of, um, uh, a lot of positive change visibly with their eyes, in other words, their, their society is the opposite of stagnating, tend to be happier um, and, and their happiness tends to increase at a faster pace. In other words, obviously in a rich and well-developed society like uh, United Kingdom and the United States, it is very difficult to think of uh, us generating 10% economic growth per year in the way that the Chinese have done uh, since the, in, during the 1980s and the 1990s um, or, or other people in the developing world. And when you see your life improving at a very fast click, it, is a, um, um, it, it seems to lead to greater optimism um, than, than in countries where, where, where where uh, progress um, is uh, much more gradual, slower, on account of the fact, partly, that those societies are already very well ahead of the rest. I, 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 will, I, I, will also add, uh, I will also add that we have a trend 12 where we look at global happiness, uh, which has been, in fact, increasing over the last 40 years, generally speaking. I, I can't speak for the, the people in the UK, but you know, cheer up. <laughs> well, maybe when our weather gets better, it's, it is raining outside. Uh, maybe if I lived in Florida or San Diego, I might be, um, we might I, be happier. There's something I also want to say. Um, very much depends on, um, on who you compare yourself to. Um, Richard Lehman, I think is his name, is a British psychologist, said, I always compare myself downwards rather than upwards. Mm. And that's uh, one of the keys to happiness. Now, what he meant by that? is that if you are a relatively well-off middle-class to upper-middle-class person in the United Kingdom and you compare yourself to um, uh, the Duke of Westminster or uh, um, <laughs> somebody super rich or somebody very beautiful or somebody um, excellent at sports and what have you, um, you are always going to be miserable because um, um, you are never going to be as rich uh, as good looking or as uh, good at sports and what have you. But if you cast your sights in the opposite direction and say to yourself, my goodness, is it not amazing? Am I not lucky that I'm not a seven-year-old child digging for cobalt in the central democratic, in the, in, in the central African Republic? That can give you a sense of perspective and can recalibrate your expectations so that you feel happier about where you are. Hmm. Almost goes back to what our parents would probably told us, you know, be grateful for what you have and compare yourself. There's always, you know, there are starving children and, uh, in, you know, dot, 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 name that country. And we would often say to them, well, actually, they can have my food if they want it, which often got a clip around the ear. Nowadays, you, you, I can't do that to my children. So that shows progress. Um, OK, um, l last question we'll just squeeze in. And this is uh, Stephen Pinker, uh, a sort of uh, a reference to Stephen Pinker. Marion mentioned Stephen Pinker's Enlightenment Now book. As a, as a young aspiring undergraduate and an IEA book club member, what three books would you recommend I purchase, other than Marion and Ron's book, of course, that goes into the topics of human progress and argues against the mainstream consensus of doom and gloom, something constantly emphasised at my university? I'm, I'm going to preempt uh, 
Ron, because he'll be too modest, but I actually thought The End of Gloom was a very, very good book and I would recommend it. Um, end of Doom, sorry. Uh, but End of Gloom might as well be. Well, yeah. I, I could be the sequel, you know. But. <laughs> Um, uh, that's, a, that's a very good book. It, it's only five years old, so go for it. Uh, Enlightenment Now. Um, a rational Optimist Optimus. is 10 years old. It is still worth reading. I cannot emphasize it enough. Yeah. Um, if you have a lot of time, uh, Deidre McCloskey's trilogy is very good on, on, on the bourgeois era. Um, um, Johann Norberg's Progress is a good book. Um, so, so those are the things to, to start with, in my view. Okay, Ron, do you want to add to his read, this uh, young undergraduate's reading material? Uh, I think I'm just going to associate myself with Marion's remarks. He's got the list down right. Oh, th th there we are. Well, that's great consensus. Well, we're just coming up to about the hour. Um, I just want to thank both uh, Marion Tupi and Ron Bailey. Thank you very much for joining us this evening. It's been a real pleasure speaking to both of you. Please don't forget their book, 10 Global Trends That Every Smart Person Needs to Know and many other trends you'll find interesting. Look at the uh, websites that we have put in the chat function to uh, find out more. Please do go out and buy the book and make both uh, Marion and Ron hopefully a, bit, a little bit richer. Uh, and so there was progress for their bank account. Um, can I also thank book club members and donors for joining us this evening? Uh, if you're not a member of the IA book club and you'd like to join, I'm going to ask for a link to be posted in a chat box on Zoom. Uh, tomorrow, uh, looking forward to our next few events, uh, future progress. Uh, Thursday the 14th of September at 5.45 p.m. UK time, we have Live in Littlewood and a stellar lineup of guests to discuss current events from a free market, classical liberal angle. It always has a peppering of uh, um, a gloom, but also some more optimism. On um, Thursday the 15th of October, 6 p.m., on the week of the um, 15th anniversary of the death of IA co-founder Arthur Selden, Professor Len Shackleton will be in conversation with his son, Sir Anthony Selden, to discuss the future of liberty. And our next IA Book Club webinar will be next Tuesday, the 20th of October at six o'clock, with Tim Harford discussing his latest book, How to Make the World Add Up, 10 Rules for Thinking Differently About Numbers. So for more details of all our online content and to stay updated on our activity, please visit our website at ia.org.uk, check out our YouTube channel, IA London, or listen to our podcast on Podbean. And to help us keep providing free content during these tough times, please do consider throwing us a few pennies, um, no matter how modest, by donating online at ia.org.uk forward slash donate hyphen now. Thank you very much for watching today. Thank you to Ron and Marion for joining us. And we hope that you'll be able to join us again soon. Good night. Thank you.